Yeah, so the Epic of Eden, uh, some of you saw that last week, and it's just going to be a wonderful immersion experience for us into the Old Testament. This Epic of Eden book that you saw flash up at the end is more than a study guide for our time together. It, it's a daily walk through understanding the Old Testament uh, for an entire 12-week series. So it's really a meaty deal. I encourage you to hook into it. You don't have to have it, but if you do want that study guide in particular, then we do need you to sign up so uh, we have that available for you. Good morning. Welcome to worship this Labor Day weekend. It's awesome to see people show up on Labor Day weekend. Um, we are moving into a new sermon series, very simply called God's Glory. And, and the reason why this is a focus for us is because we are, it's, it's, it's the hugest aspect of the Bible that is, the, I think, most often overlooked. Because we often go to Scripture looking for ourselves in it, uh, people we can relate to and how God feeds me and what God gives me and so on without looking at God's glory as the first priority. And, and I think this theme is so important and the reason we're going to focus on this in this series is, is for this reason. And I'm going to say this now and I'll say it. It'll be the last thing I say to you in my sermon this morning. And this is it. God's glory is the key to your potential. God's glory is the key to your potential. Why? Because your life and my life takes shape within God's glory in a way that it can't take shape by our own power, by our own design. Why? Because your purpose, your wholeness, your relationships take shape within God's glory in a way that it never could otherwise outside of God's intervention, God's design, God's being, God's reality. Or to quote Paul with the fruit of the Spirit, your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control take shape within God's glory in a way that it never could otherwise. We can't get there short of God's glory. Your ability to thrive takes shape within God's glory. Or let's talk about the negative side. Your pains, your problems, your losses, your fears, your frustrations, your regrets, they also take shape within God's glory there's healing and wholeness, there's perspective, there's a reality that changes and transforms those in a way that we could never do on our own. So God's glory is the key to your potential. Now, here's the caveat to that idea. The caveat is this, God, uh, it all starts with God, not you and me. It all starts with God, not you and me. It, it eventually leads to you and me. And then here's the slide that Brandon just put up. God's glory gives you and me ultimate perspective on your life. Ironically, by shifting your focus from self-interest to God's glory. It, this is not the Bible. Christianity is not about self-help. It's about being absorbed into God's glory. And the irony, the paradox, is that it puts everything else into perspective. This is not just a matter of distraction. You see, we're used to this kind of idea in different realms. You know, a magician wants to do something with a sleight of hand over here, so he gets your attention over here. That's called distraction. Or here's another one that we've all experienced in some way, or at least I have, um, going to the dentist. And I went to a dentist once, and he had this method of giving a shot. And it was a way of distracting you from the needle and from the pain. What he would do is he would take my cheek and he would do like this, and he would juggle my cheek like this while he was doing the shot. And it actually works. You're not focusing on the shot and the pain. You're focusing on, like, what are you doing here? And then before you know it, the shot's done and he's still jiggling your cheek. And it's kind of a weirdness. But that's distraction from the reality of the pain. That's not what we're talking about here with God and God's glory, what the Bible's offering with our faith. What we're talking about is not distraction. What we're talking about, what the Bible is referring to, is transformation. Transformation. Because this is the truth. Your reality is transformed as is it absorbed into a bigger reality, into God's glory. We're not just distracted from reality. It's, it's transformed into a bigger reality. And the reason this is so important for us is because we're a lot like ants. You ever watched ants, like just like stood and watched ants in your front yard or your backyard? 
And what ants do? I mean, there they are. They just follow one another. They're in their little world, oblivious to a greater world. You could stand right over ants. Do you think that they know you're there? Do you think they care that you're there? They have, they're either cutting leaves and carrying them in a line or, or little pieces of insect or little grains of sand to build their little ant colony. And they're oblivious to a greater world and to the possibilities beyond being a little ant marching in line behind other ants. What if you were standing over a line of ants and one ant actually stopped and looked up at you and spoke after you pulled your jaw off the ground? You heard this ant say to you, hey, human, you... You're awesome. You're a human being, and you are much bigger than me. I know you could squash me, but I also recognize you're incredibly intelligent as a human being in a way that I'm not as an ant. I recognize your power, your creativity. I recognize your goodness. I recognize how advanced you are in so many ways. That perspective from an ant to a human is basically what the psalmist teaches us about our perspective to God, his perspective to God. The psalmist, and we're looking today at Psalm 29 in just a second, the psalmist was an ant who looked up at God and saw a glory and a majesty far beyond human experience. And the result of seeing that reality, a bigger reality that transformed his personal experience, his reality, was Psalm 29. This majestic psalm. And this is what came out as he observed, interacted with that God, that majestic God. Psalm 29, here it is. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Now, just so that you and I are not confused about who exactly this psalm is written about, (laughs) no less than 18 times is the word Lord, the name Lord mentioned in 11 verses, 18 times, so that we're not confused. The focus here is the Lord. The focus is God. And four times the word glory is used to talk about him. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Seven times the word voice, referring to God's voice, is used. Now, that's symbolic. Seven in the Bible is the number for completion. God worked for six days, creating the world. The seventh day he rested. Why? Because all was complete. All was whole. All was as God meant it to be. There was shalom, peace, well-being. That's what seven represents. And the voice of the Lord is symbolic of that act of creation because in Genesis we see in in chapter 1, and God said, creation came to be. And God said, and God said, and God said, and creation came to be in its completeness, in its wholeness, in its beauty, in its fullness. And so the psalmist is trying to capture this in this psalm. And, and, And just like with many different text that you can look at, it's always helpful to look at adjectives and verbs. Just look at the list of adjectives here. Majestic and strong, splendor, holy, powerful, king. And then the action, what this holy, powerful king does, the verbs. Here they are. He thunders and breaks and strikes and shakes and twists and strips and gives and blesses and sits enthroned. I mean, he, he does not want us to mistake who it is this is focused on And what this God is like, this God of glory. Psalm 29 is the image of a king, a kingly God who sits enthroned over his world. It's the image of a kingly God whose glory is unmatched. Now, I I want you to bear with me for a second. I want to unpack that word with you for a second, the word glory. The word glory is the Hebrew word kavod. And like with a lot of our language, language evolves, words evolve, and the word glory or kavod has gone through three iterations that I want you to understand. The very first most basic use of glory was 
the weight or heaviness of an object. Imagine a scale, and you've got maybe some salt, you know, in ancient days, or, uh, you know, some rocks or whatever. You're trying to weigh to figure out the weight, the heaviness of an object. It's very basic, just weighing something, right? Something that's heavy. Well, that went from the literal weight of something to the figurative weight of something. You, you know the, the term, whoa, that was heavy, man. You know, when someone says something, whoa, that's weighty. You, you follow me? It refers to the second, the second sort of definition is the importance or the significance of something. The importance or the significance. You see how that kind of follows? Example. And you've been in this situation before. I had a, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You know what LinkedIn is? It's sort of this business networking social site, I guess. And, and people find you here and there. And I got a note. This is probably about three weeks ago. A woman who was one of my church members at a church in North Florida, probably eight years ago. And it was just a, hey, Tim, you know, I haven't heard from her in that whole time. Hey, Tim, here you are. You know, how are you doing? So you, know, you, you respond to something like that with just kind of surface, oh, oh great, I'm in Stewart, Florida, Stewart Congregational Church, da 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 da. You know, just sort of the, the niceties, the surface level stuff. And then I asked the million dollar question, how are you? And she said this Well, my husband, who I knew her whole family, my husband and I are divorcing because he abused me. I'm living in a shelter with our twin girls who he molested. That's weighty. That's significance. That was not just surface level. There's significance to what was being said there. And so that kind of significance, that kind of weightiness, that kind of heaviness is what the psalmist is using and the Bible is using to transfer over to God. Say, this God is not just a surface level God. There is some heaviness here. And it's associated with the third way that it kind of comes out to us. God's greatness and power and authority and holiness and interestingly enough, brilliant blinding light. Brilliant blinding light. It's kind of associated with all of that significance and importance and power and authority. That's why in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says this, God, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. This light, this significance, this importance, all associated with God's Glory. Is it any accident that you and I have heard, and there are books that have been written and movies that have been done for people that have coded, they have died and come back to life, and what do they often say? I saw a bright light. I was drawn into a warm light. I was enfolded into this light that was beautiful. Is there any accident? Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone is a Hollywood actress who had this, this exact experience, and she reports about she had a brain hemorrhage. She coded. She died. And they, were, they brought her back to life, and she came back saying that very same kind of thing. Is it any accident that what they're encountering is God's glory, God's light? And so you take all of that weightiness, that heaviness, that significance, that beauty, that power, that awe, and recognize that in the New Testament, God's glory put on a face named Jesus. God's glory put on a face Name Jesus. Why? Because, you know, we can't really relate to light. You know, light is out there. Like, okay, it's an idea. It's, you can't have a relationship with light. You can't, you can't, light doesn't really walk in your shoes, right? But a person can. God's glory put on a face named Jesus. This is the way John puts it in John chapter 1, verse 4. And listen to the words we talked about. In him, in Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then a few verses later in verse 14, he says this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory. That is why, and one of my favorite books is Ruthless Trust by Brennan Manning. He says this about Jesus and God's glory. Jesus, he says, is the power and wisdom and holiness of God Almighty. 
No thought can contain him. No word can express him. He transcends all human concepts, considerations, and expectations. He is the beyond in our midst, and though in our midst, still beyond anything we can intellectualize or imagine. Jesus Christ will always be a scandal to the murky, immodest theory-making of the intelligentsia because he cannot be comprehended by the rational, scientific, and finite mind. That deserves an amen. So to say... To say that God's glory, God's light is the key to your potential is also to say that Jesus Christ is the key to your potential. And this is hard. You know why this is hard for us? It's hard for us to focus on God's glory in and of itself apart from us because we're so focused, we're so self-focused. We, our glory, our life, our world, we revolve. and, And popular culture feeds this, feeds this so very much. Let me... It, let me illustrate this for you. I learned about this this week, very intentionally, learning about my glory and my world and all that should serve me through TV commercials. I learned this week from Mercedes Benz. For example, it's time to drive off in the luxury I deserve. Hey, it's time. It's time. I, Capital One told me, Capital One Visa told me that I can fly anywhere, anytime. They didn't tell me it would cost me, but hey, I can fly. I can do what I want through Capital One. Gillette, gentlemen, Gillette promised me the best a man can get. Whoa! I deserve the best a man can get. I'm going with Gillette. And hey, Hagen dazs Hagen dazs assures me that pleasure is the path to joy. I like that kind of pleasure. That's a path to joy, right? Did you know that? That's the path to joy. You can go to Burger King and you can what? Have it your way. Well, you can actually join the army. Why? Because they want you to be all you can be. It's all about you. Why, ladies, you should get L'Oreal. Do you know why? Because you're worth it. Do you see what I'm getting at here? The media, popular culture, the, the water we swim in feeds our glory, our self-focus, so that we are blinded to a bigger reality of God's glory. We are blinded to a bigger reality. We easily mistake God's throne for our throne, our glory, God's glory for our glory. Now, one of the things I love about the Psalms, and today we read Psalm 29, is not just the content that you can draw out that we've unpacked a little bit, But the Psalms were actually, they're instructive by their very structure. Psalm 29, as an example, the first 10 verses are God-focused and God-exalting. Only the final verse is about what we receive. However, here's our problem, and, and let me tell you, I am preaching to myself with you guys, okay? I'm right here with you. We live our lives, and even well-meaning, God-fearing Christians live their faith as if the first 10 verses are about what we want and what we receive, and only the final verse is about God. That's the challenge for us. Our glory stands in the way of God's glory. We easily live our lives that way. But remember, we're the ant. We're the ant. Looking up at this majestic God going, wait a minute, there's a bigger reality here. I need to let my reality be informed and transformed by that reality. So God knows our problem. He knows our dilemma. He knows our hurdle. And he's gracious. He's gracious. He graciously gives us the story of who he is in the Bible. But not just that. He gives us the results of his glory, the results of his light in the life we live. Let me give you two simple examples that come not from the Bible, but from the field of science. One really big example of God's light giving us and sustaining us, creating us. God's glory, God's light, it creates and sustains everything about us. And in small and big ways, it is mysterious and jaw-dropping. Here's the big way. You all have heard of the Big Bang. Big Bang theory. Scientists have talked about Big Bang Theory, and I know it's been controversial in religious circles. Uh, The idea is this. 12 to 15 billion years ago, there was this Big Bang of light, of energy that came from a star that was 80 quintillion miles away. I don't know what quintillion is, but I know it's a long way. 
80 quintillion miles away. So this is a star that created light that created from that far away. That's pretty powerful light, right? It's called a neutron star. And this neutron star was, are you ready for this? It was so dense that it could fit into a teaspoon and it was a million tons per teaspoon. I can't even get my mind around what that's like. There's so much energy packed into that light. Now, when, when that happened, here's what had to happen, and physicists tell us this. In one millionth of a second, you think, you think that when the Olympians win by one-tenth of a second, it's a big deal, like, holy moly, that's... One millionth of a second, more than 200 chemical and atmospheric parameters had to be met all at the same time, or none of it would have happened. It would have all fallen apart. And this, my friends, is why the odds are so astronomical about this happening by chance that scientists are saying there has to be something else behind it. You know what the, you know what the odds are? Here are the odds of this happening all by itself without a divine, a divine creator behind it. It's like tossing a coin. Take a quarter. You got heads and tails. Tossing a quarter 10 quintillion times and having it come up heads every single time. Those are the odds of it happening without a divine creator, an intelligent design behind it. And this, my friends, is the reason why the agnostic and perhaps world's smartest physicist, Stephen Hawking, has to acknowledge that there is something else beyond just a scientific explanation. And this is actually what he says. I quote, he says, it would be very difficult to explain why the universe would have, been, would have begun in just this way, except as the act of a God who intended to create beings just like us. God's light, God's glory, creating and sustaining the world in big ways. But you know, there's power in smallness too. And it is the case in God's light and in creation. And we see this in the world of quantum physics, quantum mechanics. It's the study of the smallest particles that exist, things that you can't see with your naked eye. For instance, physicists study photons, which are some of the smallest particles that make up light that we see by. And they, uh, they are the size of the tip, smaller than the tip of a pencil. In fact, two thousandths of a millimeter. I can't even say that. Two thousandths of a millimeter. That's how small they are. And, and scientists have discovered that you can take one photon, and if you look at a map of the United States, it's roughly 2,500 miles, let's just say from North Carolina to Oregon, from East Coast to West Coast. You can put one of those two thousandths of a millimeter photons on the East Coast and one on the West Coast, manipulate it on the East Coast, and it will simultaneously mimic without any provocation on the West Coast. And they are scratching their heads. They don't know why. They don't know why there is this sort of intelligence to a light photon. Something creative going on there that's beyond rational explanation. And so one physicist, a guy named Henry Stapp, put it this way. Elementary particles are a set of relationships that reach outward to other things. What does that sound like? That's a physicist making light particles sound like a being that has the ability to reach out and connect, talking about relationships. It's life-giving in some sense. You see, God's glory, God's light creates and sustains in large ways and in ultra-small ways. The psalmist, long before the field of science, knew this reality about God, God's glory, God's light, so he obsessively repeats, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name because it's obvious. It's obvious. And so the potential of your life is rooted in God's glory, God's light through Jesus Christ. This is the power behind it. And this is, this is why Paul, when he gets to 2 Corinthians, he put it this way, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Do you see how it all comes together in Jesus? All of this comes together in him. Jesus is God's glory. Jesus is God's light with a face. 
And so, in the Gospel of John, it says very simply in John chapter 11, Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Believing, in other words, is seeing. Seeing is not believing. A lot of people saw Jesus and didn't believe. You have to have a heart that is open to believe, and then you see his glory. Then the light floods your heart, your mind, your life. Believing is seeing. We have access to God's glory, God's light through Jesus Christ. And this is Jesus' prayer for us. This is at the, at the Last Supper, which we're celebrating today with, with communion. Jesus sat around the table, and his final prayer, his final prayer was for his disciples, was for us. And this is part of what he said in John chapter 17. Speaking to the Father, he said, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying, I've come to share this glory with you. That's where your potential is found. That's where wholeness and peace and well-being, where shalom, where the richness of God's grace is found. So here, here are a couple questions for you. What is it that you bring here today before God, before his glory? What is it you bring here today that hurts? What is it that hurts? What is it that hangs on to you? What, what is it that needs healing? What is it that confuses you or that angers you? What is it that breaks your heart? What is it that perhaps you can't shake? What is it that plagues you? Because whatever it is, God's glory wants to shine into that, wants to recreate it, wants to bring light and life as only God can. Believing is seeing. The God of glory shines his healing light on you and me. The God of glory shines his light. The God of glory wants to recreate you and me through Jesus Christ. You and I are made in the image of this God of glory. You know why? So that we would be image bearers of God's light, of God's glory. So as I said in the beginning, God's glory is the key to your potential. Amen? And today we come to the table, and this, friends, is a symbol of God's glory. Think about the weightiness and the significance of what this represents. Jesus died so that we might know life in its fullness, even in our brokenness, in our sin, in our waywardness, in our unfaithfulness. He comes to us to give us his glory through the sacrifice of a son, through the glory and light of God, that put a face on to come to you and me so that we might not be left orphans so that we might be called his children his family that we might know him in this life and in the life to come and so I stand here not as the one who presides over this table or as the host of it Jesus Christ is the host of this table it's his it's about him it, it is he who offers himself to you and as we encounter him through this meal, we encounter his glory, his light. And I simply invite you, along with me, to let that light flood into the dark places, into the broken places, into the hurting places, as only God can do. That is his invitation to you and to me. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to come to the table as is our custom at this service, we come down the center aisle and receive communion by what's called intinction. It simply means taking a piece of the bread, ripping it off, and then dipping it into the cup and then taking it. And then you can re return to your seat along the side aisles. If there's anyone here who needs elements brought to their seat, we'll certainly be happy to do that. But friends, remember that this is the table of the Lord. It's a reminder of the night in which he was betrayed and after giving thanks for the meal before them, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given to you, take and eat. In the same manner, pouring from the fruit of the vine, he said, this is the cup of salvation shed for the remission of your sins. Drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God 
for the people of God. And we feast on them with great joy and thanksgiving in our hearts. With utter humility that this great God of glory loves us sacrificially and unconditionally. I'm going to invite any members of the band or tech team to come forward to receive communion and then simply ask that you follow in line behind them down the center aisle as you receive this Holy Communion. <laughs>